Hebrews 11, part three, starting in verse 20, uh, 20 or 21, somewhere in there. Anybody feel like reading? I nominate you. I'll read uh, uh, verse 25, I think. So I'll start with 20. So Isaac had faith, so he blessed Jacob and Esau. He told them what was ahead for them. Jacob had faith, so he blessed each of Joseph's sons. He blessed them when he was dying. Because of his faith, he worshiped God as he leaned on top of his wooden staff. Joseph had faith, so he spoke to the people of Israel about their leaving Egypt. He gave directions about his bones. He did that toward the end of his life. Moses' parents had faith, so they hid him for three months after he was born. They saw he was a special child. They were not afraid of the king's command. Moses had faith, so he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That happened after he had grown up. He chose to be treated badly together with the people of God. He chose that instead of enjoying sin's pleasure for a short time. I'll keep going a little bit. He suffered shame because of Christ. He thought it had great value. He considered it better than the riches of Egypt. He was looking ahead to God's reward. Because of his faith, he left Egypt. It wasn't because he was afraid of his, the king's anger. He did, didn't let anything stop him. He saw the one who can't be seen. Because of his faith, he was the first to keep the Passover peace. He commanded the people of Israel to sprinkle blood on their doorways. He did it so that destroying the that the destroying angel would not touch their oldest sons. Um, I suppose I'll go one more. The people had faith, so they passed through the Red Sea. They went through it as they as if it were the dry land. The Egyptians tried to do it also, but they drowned. That's probably a good spot to stop. Yeah. All right, we all got on that section. How did uh, Isaac know what was ahead for Jacob and Esau? Uh, what, what verse was that? Uh, verse 20. 20. It says he blessed him and told them what was going to happen to them, basically. Uh, well, is that basically the land promises, or is that is that? Before or after uh, he, uh, Jacob stole stole the birthright from yeah, Esau with the lentils. <laughs> was it before or after? Well, he. I mean, the blessing was given before, and then he sold it for the lentils. Well, he sold the birthright, not the blessing, right? Right. No, he stole. He he came back first. Isn't that like the same? Thing? He he. So, no, he I think there's a his, difference. You're right. He <laughs> sold the birthright first, and then he stole the blessing. That was. Oh yeah, that's when he like dressed up as like a. He didn't steal the birthright. Like Esau just no, not the birthright, birthright. The blessing. Jacob stole the blessing, yeah. not the birthright. He bought yeah. the birthright for the bowl of soup. Right. Esau just said, "Screw it, I don't want this." Right. Like I don't even care about it. Well, he, he didn't really say that. He said like basically, what's the point in having it if I'm going to be dead anyway? Give me food. Does Esau despised his birthright? <laughs> right. All right. Um, a type of being, um, you know, short-sighted in the flesh, essentially. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was like, oh, well, what's the point in this? I'm going to be dead anyway. What do I need it for? I don't, I don't care. Then later yeah, he found it, out. Like, he it, was uh, th this is a mellow text. We're at verse 20. 20. Where, uh, by faith, Isaac invoked blessings on Jacob and Esau, even regarding mellow things, mellow like the word about to, yeah, about to come. Oh, so the future blessing about to come to Jacob and Esau. So maybe that is maybe that they did think about the Rob, Rob mentioned the, the land. Um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the overarching theme here, though, is just 
it wasn't a legalist law type system that they were following to continue this line down. It was by faith. Yes. Greg, uh, that's the biggest thing is that it was by faith, by faith, this, by faith, that. Yeah, Not everybody in that. everybody in this chapter, it's by faith, right? Yes, by faith, your boy Enoch was translated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think what the writer of Hebrews is trying to, because obviously he's speaking to, or he or she is speaking to Hebrews, if this is Priscilla. Because um, they've been for so long, just, well, the law of Moses is everything. You know, this legalistic system is everything. How can we go on without the temple? You know, why would we follow this so-called Messiah if everything is working well with this temple? And you're like, well, there wasn't always a time when there was a temple. There wasn't even always a tabernacle. Well, before that, it, these people just had to have faith. That's all they had, you know, to get through. It wasn't well until, you know, Moses that there was uh, a system, but even Moses himself had to go through all of these uh, trials just by faith. Um, some of them quite, quite harrowing. Like, you know, if you're going to go before Pharaoh, who's considered God on earth, who commands the most mighty army ever known at that time and say, hey, look, you're going to have to let my people go or I'm going to put it down on you. You got to have some pretty big faith. Well, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> He's like, yo, Pharaoh, dude, like, hey, what's up, my guy? Uh, you're going to let my people go, or my God shall turn your water to blood. Frogs, right? <laughs> no, I, I couldn't imagine. Oh, my gosh. That's, yeah, you got to have pretty big cojones to go up against the, the greatest uh, person on the earth at the time, pretty much, right? Yeah, it's it's faith. And then, of course, Rahab, you know, even after he's saying even after the covenant came, the first oh. covenant, later on in the chapter here, just a couple of verses down, you know, Rahab wasn't a, a Jewish woman. She was a Gentile woman. Oh, I uh, love Rahab. Yeah, she's in the city, you know, and so she doesn't know anything about this covenant uh, at Sinai, but it was by faith that she did what she did. So even after so they're saying, well, you could argue that before the covenant, that was fine. But then when the covenant came, you have to do all this stuff. Well, he says, no, even after the covenant, people like Rahab and so on, still it was by faith that they were saved, not by keeping the law. Because she had never kept the law of Moses a day in her life. Right. And then she was grafted in. Right. Exactly. What do you guys think of verse 26? This version says he suffered shame because of Christ, referring to uh, Moses. I don't know if other versions have that similar language. It is crystal, so I agree. Uh, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ, the Messiah, in other words, than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. So this is similar to what you know the rest of the passage was saying. It seems uh, like he was having it's shown that he had faith in Christ potentially even way back well, before Christ he, even came on the scene. Well, he, he already saw Christ before before he ever even left Egypt. Yeah, Christians would say he spoke to him mouth to mouth or face to face, as it says in Numbers 12, you know. He yep. was the only one. And he saw him in the burning bush. Yeah. Uh, in verse 20 and 21, probably worth noting that both both of the sons, the firstborn and the younger, both received blessings. Jacob and Esau were both blessed. Uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, Jacob blessed Joseph's sons, which would have been Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, Genesis 48. Um, so they, bo they both received blessings. And both the old covenant and new covenant had blessings and had glory, even though the new covenant has greater blessings and greater glory. They, uh, was it second Corinthians three, the old covenant had glory, even though, you know, for a time, even though it was fading, you know, Moses face did have glory. It was shining. It was fading when you had the veil and all that, but still, still had glory for a time. Yeah. And he, well, he of course didn't get to come into the rest. He didn't come into 
promised lands. Uh, Aaron, Aaron did not either, right? It was just Joshua and Caleb and those under 20. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron died. Yeah. Yep. So, and, and this is, uh, you know, uh, reiterated in the Transfiguration on the Mount. Yes, uh, Moses, Matthew 17, you got Moses and Elijah uh, appearing. So the theme I'm, I see here is even though both sons, like you're saying, get blessed, you know, we have Ishmael uh, becoming a, a great nation. Uh, even Esau founded a great nation. You know, when uh, his brother comes back, he's a king. He's protecting him from his oppressors. He's like, come and live with me. I'll happily give you whatever you need. You know, they weren't really at odds at that point. They were both very wealthy. Uh, but you still have this idea that one of them is blessed here in the in the earthly existence in a fleshly existence while the other one is and that's what he says he says no no i, I don't need to live with you brother thank you very much i don't need your cattle i have my own um, i'm going to go find my own place in other words saying you're living your your way this fleshly way this of the legalistic way and we live by faith by spirit so we're going to move over here and obviously the edomites were destroyed so it's saying those who have faith and walk in the spirit rather than the flesh are the ones who continue on, as the writer of Hebrews is trying to explain. As this old covenant fades to a new covenant, it's a similar dynamic. You all see any significance or anything with verse 21? The, uh, he worshiped leaning on the top of his staff the thing with that i don't know if we see that anywhere else in scripture or not I mean, there's you just, you just read all that stuff with the staff. You know, there's there's a lot of symbolism in the staff, you know, um, all throughout Scripture, as being the symbol of authority of God. You know, it uh, it can turn into a serpent, but it can also balance you. Uh, it it budded to show that the Levite, you know, Aaronic the Aaronic priesthood, so. There's a lot of stuff going on with the staff. So, Greek word there in the New Testament for staff. It's used 12 times in the New Testament. It's actually used before uh, in Hebrews uh, twice Hebrews 1 8 and 9 4. 1 8 is obviously about Jesus. Your throne, O gods, forever and ever, scepter, uh, scepter of your kingdom, same, so same word there. Uh, chapter 9, verse 4, when he's talking about the, the old covenant, first covenant. Yeah, yeah, it's right. it budded, yeah. Generally uh, seen as the symbol of authority um, from wonder, God. Zach, do you know in the Septuagint, is that the same word that's used in uh, Genesis 49.10? Uh, probably. Until Shiloh comes? Probably. But I'm, I can't get up and go look. Who was, it who, who was it who traded their staff to for uh, a night with the temple prostitute and then had to go get it back in shame? Like Judah. Judah, Judah uh, Genesis 38. Judah. Yeah. Turned out to be Tamar. Right? So, you know, the, the staff symbolizing resting your worship and authority in God and on Christ, as opposed to trading it away for the pleasures of the flesh. So sort of having faith in the staff, i.e. God worshiping on your staff, having faith in God. 22, by faith. Joseph, at the end of his life, spoke about the Exodus 
of the sons of Israel gave instructions regarding the burial of his bones. I don't know if, if we can find a scripture one way or another with Joseph, but I know with his father, Jacob, I've pointed this out many times, that in Genesis 49, Jacob dies and is gathered to his people. And then in the next chapter, the last chapter of Genesis, Genesis 50, uh, there's like 40 days or 70 days pass for like the days of, of mourning uh, for him and the embalming. And then Joseph says, like, let me go and, and bury my father, uh, which shows that, you know, he was already gathered to his people 40 days or 70 days prior to him being buried. So that common phrase gathered to their people that's used in the book of Genesis, whether it's with Ab or not just Genesis, but in the Old Testament, whether it was Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, I don't, I'm not sure about Joseph. I know it's used with Moses and Aaron as well, I think, that it's not talking about like a common burial site, but it's talking about them being gathered in the afterlife, Sheol or Hades. Yeah. I'm not sure if we can, if we have a scripture like that with Joseph, like we do for with certainty with people like Abraham and Jacob and Moses and Aaron, but something to throw out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. It, it seems to elude that as he's saying, take my bones with you, you know, I, I want to be gathered with my people uh, after death in Sheol, for example, you know, as a type of saying that he has faith in the fact that there is this place, this bosom of Abraham, this place where God is going to keep them. And that's part of what it's saying here, that he has faith in that. I, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, 23... Moses, when he was born, was hid three months. Uh, kind of makes you think about Jesus being hidden, right? The, all the overlapping, all the parallels with the, between Moses and the Exodus story and Jesus. Uh, Herod, Herod, like the new Pharaoh. Uh, the male children killed. Male children being killed with Moses. Uh, you know, the Red Sea. Uh, the baptism of Jesus, 40 days on the mountain, 40 days in the wilderness, the law of Moses given, the Sermon on the Mount given, all those overlapping things between Moses, Pharaoh, Exodus, Egypt, first seven chapters of Matthew. And then you've got this the same story with Joshua, you know, crossing the River Jordan with the ark and um, yep. going, going on to Mount Zion instead of Mount Sinai. So, you know, yes. a lot of the similar... Uh, archetypes going on there. Yep. Well, he did say, Jesus, Jesus did say that Moses spoke of me. Yes. John 5 46. If you believe Moses, you believe me, for he wrote about me. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. 20, um, 24 by faith when Moses grown up disdained or denied renounced being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer hardship with the people of God but that makes it sound like it was his choice No one forced him to do that, right? Contrary to doctrines of irresistible grace. Other things. Um, Y'all got anything else? On this? Have we started Hebrews? Yeah, Rob, Rob read. Oh, you're uh, recording. Yeah, we're recording. Rob read verses uh, 20 through 20, 20 through okay. 20. Sorry, guys. I wasn't paying attention. I was making dinner. Yeah, so Rob read 20 through 29. We were just going through talking about it. Okay.
Uh, I like verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the anger of the king, for he endured as though seeing the one who is unseen or the one who is invisible. I think 29 is pretty poignant too, because you know it's the same the same thing that saved the faithful Israel that just went right through the sea was the same force that destroyed the Egyptians. So yep. it's kind of saying it's this can either be good for you or bad for you, depending on what side of this you're on. Just like we know, you know, that's basically how God is. Yep. Yes, it's kind of like that with other things too in scripture, like the glory cloud or like like God coming on clouds. Sometimes it's seen as in reference to providing protection, salvation, uh, deliverance for his people, whether it be with the cloud, Exodus 13, you know, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. It, it would be on, rest on the tabernacle or the temple. And uh, like with the tabernacle, when the cloud would be lifted up and moved, it would, it would let the children of Israel know, okay, it's time to go. So it would kind of be there for a covenant with them, with the cloud. But other scriptures speak of God coming with clouds to destroy the, the wicked, destroy the enemies. Yeah, you also have the idea of like just Jesus. Jesus saves those who obey the gospel, but then he also will send the people that disobey into the fire. Yep. yep. Yeah, then he's he is associated heavily with water, so that would tie very well into the Red Sea party and it, crushing it. Uh Matthew three twelve, speaking of Jesus, his winnowing fork is in his hand. Thoroughly clear his threshing floor, gather the wheat to, into the barn, burn up the chaff, unquenchable fire. Yep. A revelation yeah, fourteen. Re Re revelation fourteen. Uh, yeah. two, the two different harvests, right? Um, the the reaping of uh, of some, and then the the others are reaped. But you know, some are being reaped for a blessing. Blessed are they who die in the Lord from now on. Versus the other ones who are being gathered for the trading of the wine press, the wrath of God. Right? And then what, who do you have? He's when he's speaking about, you know, you say it's four months to the harvest, but you're just using that for your, from your knowledge rather than looking out at the fields and seeing that they're white, ready to be reaped. This uh, destroy, verse 20, 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroying angel would not touch their firstborn. Do we, we, I guess we don't have any other information about this. Do we have, is there anything in scripture that would lead us to believe that this destroying angel was like the angel of the Lord, like the pre-incarnate Christ, or this was just some unspecified angel doing God's bidding, but isn't really like the pre-incarnate Jesus? Yeah, I'm not, not that I'm aware of. I don't. I don't have anything. Yeah, I think it just says like the the angel of destruction, angel of death, or something like that. Yeah, I don't like think... Exodus like eleven and twelve. Yeah, oh, Exodus, uh, like ten, like that. 10, 11. Uh, eleven and twelve. Exodus ten is the plague of the locusts and the darkness. Uh, Exodus eleven is God's promise: the firstborn will die. But he does mention like he is coming to do it, but then you read Exodus 12 and it's like the angel, or it's vice versa. I haven't looked at that in a while, but so Exodus 10, you get the plague of locusts dark and darkness. Exodus 11, God's promise the firstborn will die, and in Exodus 12, you have the actual death of the, the firstborn, Passover. the Passover lamb, and the Exodus mm -hmm. from Egypt, all in chapter 12. Yeah, um, in the context of Hebrews, I guess we're Again, just saying this was the first time this had ever happened, and it was just you had to have faith in this lamb. And you're like, how is a lamb going to save us of all things, you know? Well, but not the first time we see uh, a lamb. Uh, well, I guess maybe the first time we see a lamb, but was it back in Genesis 22? It was a ram on that occasion, but, you know, was it Genesis 22, verse 8? A Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide the lamb. Ultimately, all these, whether it was, you know, the Garden of Eden, whether it was with what Abel offered, whether Genesis 4, whether it was 
Genesis 22 with Abraham and Isaac, whether it was here in Exodus 12, it's all typological, right? It's all foreshadowing. Yeah, it's it's not it's not it, the sacrifice doesn't come from us. It has the, like you were saying the it was God that provided the the animal clothing for Adam and Eve. It, ultimately, the sacrifice that would work is the one that God provides, and you just have to have faith in that. So you've got uh, here you got the first the death of the firstborn. Is it Exodus chapter four where when God's t commissioning Moses, telling him and giving him credentials and things to go down to? He says. Uh, is that where he calls to Israel his firstborn? Yeah, verse 22. So even Israel is called God's firstborn. And so you may, might even have like some foreshadowing with those events. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Israel is the firstborn. That's you now the dot that is going to be cut off or be killed. Like Old Covenant Judaism be cut off. I know Matthew's book talked about that. Um, yeah, again, the whole book of Hebrews, I think, has that theme. Uh, about Israel being the firstborn, just like they're talking even this chapter we just read about, you know, uh, Esau, um, Ishmael is this firstborn that doesn't receive ultimately the uh, eternal spiritual promises. They might be blessed here on earth, and that's good, but ultimately it's the faithful remnant, the faithful brother who is the second the second sons that are going to be, uh, and I guess that's a type of, you know, it's not going to be these rich Pharisees that are going to inherit. It's going to be the faithful. Um, anybody got any other thoughts on 20 through 28 or 20 through 29? I mean, uh, I was just looking into, <clears throat> not really a, um relevant per se to this hebrews 11 but you mentioned that you said it was a ram instead of a lamb and i was just looking at the similarities of rams and lambs it seems like i mean a ram comes from a lamb is the way i'm reading it at one point in time it's just an age difference and things of that nature as well and it seems like they can be used interchangeably potentially Okay. I've, I've always heard a lot of people explain it as uh, God provided a ram on that occasion, but he provided the lamb, you know, 2,000 years later. Was it John 1, 29, John 1, 35, 36. Behold, the lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Yeah, I was just I was looking at giving me a lot of biblical information. I looked it up scientifically. It says supposedly rams and lambs belong to the same species, which means they can interbreed and produce offspring. Um, isn't a ram a male yeah mm -hmm. yeah even the lamb in uh exodus 12 had to be a, a lamb that was a male uh what was it one year old unblemished is that right for the passover lamb mm -hmm. yeah why only so. one year well, there that, was a debate on that, wasn't it? That is, there was a difference, you know, a lot of people weren't you, Zach, weren't you a one year ministry man? Um and I mean I three year said it a little bit. Yeah, there's the debate, but it's really yeah. just like one old manuscript, but that's not even that old, it's like the eighth century. There's like a textual variant within like I think it's the uh Gospel of John that talks about that there was only like I think it's in verse chapter six where it talks about a passover so the reason that there's three years is because there's three mentionings of passovers in jesus's ministry yeah yeah but if there's a textual variant then there isn't three and whatever so it's like what's a michael that? hebrew roots kind of thing what's the average lifespan of a lamb well they stopped 33 being, not called a lamb anymore after a certain period of time right Five minutes, because I'm gonna eat it. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one, to be honest. I mean, I don't know. I've I've always heard people. I don't know if it's true or not. I've always heard people say that it's like one year old because that's like the prime of life, like for a you know a lamb or whatever. Like that's. But anyway, a ba a baby is a lamb. A lamb is a baby. That's what it is. Lamb. Child. Yeah, lamb means under one year of age. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a baby. Yeah. 
that's what and then and then maybe, it's, maybe it like the ram or animal. whatever you know i didn't know like in the was, animal yeah. in the animal world because like with do like dogs like one year's like seven for human or something right i didn't know what it's well, like they say animals. that but like where's your proof for that like come on now. Yeah, like after after a lamb, it becomes a sheep. Basically, they are classified as a sheep. <laughs> so there you go. He just called you a sheeple, Andrew. Well, while it's still <laughs> just, just while it's still young or innocent, I don't know different ways. People well, look, they say that, um, like in the carnivore world, the lamb is one of the most nutritious meats. And it has that's a perfect, what, that's a perfect amount delicious. of fat for protein. And it's and it, delicious. So it's really tender. And they're uh, there's grass probably lots too. of linear. What's that? And they're grass fed. But I don't think they really eat grain. I'm not. I'm not. I remember really when sure. I worked when I worked in the butcher shop. They that's pretty much like one of the big things that they were saying. They're like lambs aren't like fed the same diet as like most cattle and they really only stick to grass so that's kind of i don't know if that was 100 percent true but that's what the butcher guy told me so i was like oh interesting hmm. should google that yeah probably should sounds made up because i know up here we have sheep and um we don't have grass all year round right whoa that's rude. So I don't know if uh, right. they would just eat hay. I don't, or they wouldn't, because I know our cattle get fed grain over the winter, right? Yeah. Or when they're coming to slaughter. Yeah, the grain makes it uh, get really fatty. But what yeah. happens when you burn your own grain supply? When you and, um, and what happens when you burn your own grain supply and Romans are encroaching on your territory? Mm, things don't go well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. you guys are talking about getting all fat and stuff. I'm talking about famines. And, oh my god. Well, we got ten more verses. We finishing it up, or are we gonna do part four next time? We're gonna get distracted. No, we're gonna finish it because we're not having a part four, dude. I told you it's bad for the YouTube algorithms. Stop doing part one. Albert, two, three, I can't two. control how long people. Uh, want to I don't care if you can't control. It. Do it anyway. I, I can't. I can't <laughs> do that. It's, t it's ten verses. Number thirty. It's, it's okay. It's I'll just string them all together because Rob gave me the technology, so I, I can just. Somebody string them all read number thirty to thirty-nine. Do it. Do it. Do it. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and oh. the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do we need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and all of the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of a sword. <clears throat> Their weaknesses were turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over the deserts and the mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. These people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. What, uh, what uh, version are you reading? Uh, this is the NLT. Um, 
It's, it's quite a bit different than the, N, the NLT is New Living Translation. Yeah. I was just following along in the New King James. But it, it has a completely different slant to how you read it. They, they've translated it to be read aloud. Is this Rahab mentioned in the lineage of Jesus? I, I would assume so. It would be assumed so, but we can't be certain. Yeah, we don't have any. Uh, I mean, other than saying that she was the prostitute that was not destroyed with the people in her city. So I don't know how many of those there would be, but it seems to point to her, but we're not 100%. Is it? Matthew chapter 1 or Luke 3 or both? Uh, I don't see it in... I think it's Matthew. I, I don't see it in Matthew's account. What, what did yours say? Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection? Um, what does yours say? Uh, others were read. tortured, re refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. So in other words, they didn't deny God just for their freedom. They placed their hope in the life after the resurrection. Okay. It's interesting after the resurrection that said after the resurrection that uh, some translations say so they might gain a better resurrection. That's what mine says. So, do you, st uh, Andrew, and you would still stand that this better resurrection is that these saints were resurrected well this after is like, the church yes after uh, the early church yes um i think the last two verses here saying that they did not receive what had been promised uh for god has provided something better with us in mind so that they should not reach their goal their Teleao. Uh, I wonder if that's like the. I wonder if that's like the verb form of telos. I'm not sure. Probably, uh -huh. but uh, they would not reach their goal apart from us. Um, I think we the other night when we went over verses uh, nine through twenty, I noticed something also in the Greek. I think on verse fourteen which I think also goes along with this idea. In verse 14, it says, for those who speak in uh, such a way, make it clear, that, and this is talking about all those who died. So verse 13 said, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. Verse 14, for those who speak in such a way, make it clear that they are seeking. So the people who died are, it's present active indicative in the Greek on verse 14. So that also, I think, supports the idea that the Old Testament saints that this chapter is talking about have had not yet reached uh, the highest heaven. They weren't there yet. There, there was about to be the resurrection not many years after this letter was written, but they're not there yet. Like the other scriptures that teach that the Christians, the New Testament saints who died, during the transition period, the 11th hour workers, the first fruit of the new covenant, they were there already immediately upon their deaths to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. But these Old Testament saints had to wait until the, the full number of the first fruit New Testament saints were gathered in. Then they get gathered in. I think verse 14 and these last two verses here support that idea. I would agree. I think Jesus uh, says something to when he's talking to the Pharisees and his uh, speeches to them to that effect that until these me this measure is full and then 
all of this will go down. You're going to receive your judgment, and then the re I'm going to resurrect those who deserve it. Yeah, D Daniel was told he would rise at the end of the age for his inheritance. Uh, Dan last verse in Daniel, Daniel 12, 13. So you got the Old Testament saints rising at the end of the age. Of course, end of the age is associated also in Matthew 24, 3 with the destruction of the temple. So it all seems to go together there. Now, I have a question about the better resurrection. Uh, for those of you that speak Greek, is that the way that generally that was taught to me is that this is saying rather than just like Lazarus, who was raised from from life back to life here in this world, that that better resurrection is a resurrection in paradise. Is that does the Greek support that, or is that just something um, that you're up with? I don't. I don't think the Greek on this verse, verse thirty-five. I don't think you can get that out of the Greek one, one way or the other. It's going to have. You're going. Someone's going to have to bring in their their presuppositions, their their own theological whatever uh, to make it go one to make it fit one way or the other. Because I don't just based on like the grammar or just based on the wording itself, I don't think you get any particular uh, when it, any particular thing one way or the other on that. Um, but this idea, but, the, but it does bring up the question though, right? Because what, what is this idea of a better resurrection? Because there's, there's different resurrections in scripture, just like there's different deaths in scripture. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's spiritual, sometimes it's uh, uh, Hadean. Uh, I actually looked up some scriptures the other day and found that um, when the Bible talks about the dead, uh, of course, it's not always talking about people who are, uh, so sometimes when the Bible talks about the dead, it's talking about like physical bodies that don't have any life in them. Other, uh, other times when it talks about the dead it means like those who are spiritually dead like jesus says follow me let the dead bury their own dead or the the father's love uh parable or the prodigal son whatever you want to call it luke 15 the son of mine was dead he's come to life again obviously spiritually speaking not not physical and there's other scriptures that i recently found where some pe people are referred to as dead but it's talking about disembodied spirits uh in sheol or in hades and in, in, in the uh waiting place in the afterlife um so we're talking about dead or death or, res or raising rising or resurrection people always i think have to be careful when it comes to well which particular one are we dealing with in any given context right um, so. i also had another question if y'all don't mind um here in, in verse 32, it seems about this, you know, this um, theme of faith, but he does mention Gideon first in the letter. He or she mentions Gideon first in the in the list. And I, I thought that was interesting because get, didn't Gideon throw out a fleece to test the faith, sort of? What do you all think of that? Yes. Uh, where was that at, Albert? Is that Judges, or, is that Judges 6? Is that right? Judges 6? I can't remember. Getting into Old Testament stuff now. I'm not an Old Testament expert by any means. Well, I'm not a New Testament expert either. I mean, I'm not an expert in anything. But I definitely don't know the Old Testament as well as I, do, as I know the New Testament. I think it's around Judges 6, um, somewhere in there. But just because, I mean, it mentions David too, right? Uh, that same verse. It, it says Gideon, uh, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David. I mean, David uh, had Uriah killed. David committed adultery. You know, he's still, in, he, there's no problem for him still being in the list. So uh, maybe it's just more about the heart and the faith of the people rather than, you know, because clearly if David's mentioned in, in the same verse as Gideon, it, it, it's it's not based on their own moral uh, ability, uh, their own uh, ethic, ethical choices. Yeah, I mean, that, we could definitely say that for Samson, uh, for sure, right? Yeah, I would say so. Um, but I, but I, I would say this, back to this better resurrection in verse 30, uh, 35, um, 
Women received their dead by resurrection, but others were tortured, refusing release, so they might gain a better resurrection. I mean, I think I think the first the first resurrection of verse thirty five is talking about physical death, like physically dead people and physical physically raised. Like, uh, was it was it a Eli- was it Elijah or Elisha who raised the physically raised the widow's son? Yeah, Elisha. So, but so that would be like the the first part of that verse here. Women received back their physically dead by a physical resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing ex- to accept release, so they might gain a better resurrection. So there's a better resurrection than just physically coming back to life and then dying again. Right. Like, so, well, what resurrection would that be? Well, I think First Corinthians 15 talks about that one, which is like, well, it's it's not a resurrection for this life. It's being resurrected out of Sheol or Hades into heaven itself, like where Jesus is. That's that's the better resurrection. We're gonna I, have just, to I just wish there was a way we could show that more clearly, you know. Um, I don't know if that's possible. I mean, it's, 1 Corinthians 15 says in verse 19, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So this, and I think, uh, is it, Matthew or Luke's account, I can't remember which Synoptic Gospels account it is, where Jesus, when he's talking with the Sadducees, and he talks about the, the those who obtain to the resurrection, uh, um, like they'll, they'll be like the angels, they won't be able to die anymore, right? Yeah, that might be something interesting to put together, you know, so that people can see that when when they're talking, sometimes when resurrection is being mentioned, and specifically here, a better resurrection what does that mean? I mean, we know there's resurrections of Lazarus. We know there's resurrections, obviously, of Christ. Paul resurrected the young man who fell out of the window because his sermon was so boring. You know, well, all of I mean, I, could you could, could you imagine a resurrection that would be classified as a greater resurrection than never dying again? Right. That's that's what I'm getting at. I, I think that's what it's saying. Um, but there are people who want to I don't know, not go that route. So it might be interesting to put something together so that. Yes. Uh, I mean, I would. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but I couldn't imagine anyone thinking that there's somehow a better resurrection than a, than a resurrection where you are raised to never die again. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that to be raised to never die again. Being with some, Jesus. Some, some people will use it as a, a reincarnation reference. OK. OK. Um well, I mean, Jesus says, like, in, when he's talking to the Sadducees, the, uh, in, you know, in the resurrection, they'll be like the angels, and they'll, they'll be in, which are in heaven, which, and they'll never die again. So it's, Jesus definitely did not teach uh, reincarnation. I don't think the other biblical authors did either, but I mean, I guess people can twist anything they want to, to make. Yeah, better. No, they're just gonna, they're going to pull scripture out, so. Sure. Um. Anybody got anything else here on these verses? Where where was the verse about the people who were like sawn in two? What verse was that? Uh, That's 37. 37. Yeah, word testing. They were stoned, sawn in two, murdered by the sword. Do we do, we don't read about anyone in scripture who actually got sawn in too do we we would probably have to go like outside of scripture to read some kind of historical documents like or something i don't think there's anything in scripture to my knowledge that talks about someone being sawn in two probably some of the prophets you know they they put in sentences here like they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. <laughs> mm. Elijah, you know? Elijah did that, right? I remember the story. Was it First Kings seventeen or Second Kings seventeen? Somewhere where. Elijah was in the cave and wasn't like ravens brought him food and water or something. I can't remember. Um, you know, John yeah, John the Baptist yeah. also. Yep. Well. 
yeah, it's pretty wild when you think about what the Old Testament saints went through and then even worse than what they went through with the first century saints, what the Christians in the first century went through because Jesus said they went through a tribulation period that was nothing like it before it or after it. But... Anybody got any other thoughts on Hebrews 11? I'm going to pass. No, I'm just excited for chapter 12 next time. Great. I'll end the recording here. Chapter 12 next time. Don't forget to subscribe, like, hit that notification bell. <laughs>